Before we dive into today's insightful discussion, I want to share some updates that will enhance your FemPower Health experience. We're excited to launch our new interactive newsletter. This weekly newsletter is packed with the latest scientific findings, business insights, and essential updates in the realm of women's health. Signing up is easy. Just visit our website or click the link in the show notes. Our website is also a comprehensive resource organized by topic for your convenience. Whether you're delving into the latest research, exploring any trends in healthcare, or seeking information in specific health topics, it's all there at your fingertips. Additionally, for our Spotify users, we've created playlists categorized by these topics, offering you another way to stay informed and engaged. And for those listening on Apple Podcasts, while we can't categorize content within the app, our website remains a central hub for all of these resources. And be sure to take advantage of these tools to stay on top of the evolving world of women's health, science, and business. Now let's get started with today's episode. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. A lot of these devices are for what we call hypotonic pelvic floor, where your pelvic floor muscles are kind of floppy, right, and weak. Um, and it, there's the second aspect is hypertonic pelvic floor, where your pelvic floor muscles are in spasm, so they're short spastic, and they're still weaker, though. Either way, they're weak, honestly. It's just one is in spasm and one is um, loosey-goosey um, hypotonic. Our pelvic floor muscles play an important role in our body. They support the bladder, bowel, and the uterus, and they also prevent incontinence of bladder and bowel and prolapse, and are also important in sexual function. The pelvic floor can be weakened by pregnancy, childbirth, obesity, and the straining of chronic constipation. And so today, I bring to you Dr. Allison Shrikande, a board-certified physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist, and she is the chief medical officer of pelvic rehabilitation medicine. And I brought her on today because the great news is so much more is being talked about our pelvic floor, and we also have more resources. However, Because of that, what's happening now is we have so many resources. In fact, there's a lot of at-home devices that we can use to support our pelvic floor. So I thought it would be great to bring Dr. Shrikande back and talk about these different devices. So we actually do a comparison. It is a fascinating discussion, and I greatly appreciate Dr. Shrikande's expertise and thoughtfulness in sharing her views on the different types of products that are out there. So take a listen, and I hope that this provides some guidance for you as you are trying to support your pelvic floor. It's been a couple of years since we last spoke, and you were actually one of my first pelvic health-related episodes. And I will tell you, my guests love learning about the pelvic floor. And I really appreciate you joining me today because since we spoke, there have been so many products coming on the market 
for at-home devices to support women and their pelvic floor strength. And I thought it would be a great idea to get an expert to share her thinking around these different tools um, because they are helpful, but there are potential risks. So that's what we're here to talk about today. So for those who may not have um, gotten to know you yet from the previous episode, maybe we can start with an introduction of your specialty and, and your work, and then we can dive right in. Thank you, Georgie. Thanks for having me back. And I'm a huge fan of FemPower Health, and um, I follow you closely. So I'm really excited to be back. Um, so my name is Dr. Allison Augusta Shrikande. I am the co-founder of Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine, and I am a physiatrist. Uh, most people don't know what that is, but it's a, a outpatient rehabilitation doctor. Uh, where we focus on really the muscles, nerves, and joints of the body. Um, but at Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine, we are pelvic physiatrists. So we are the non-operative um, pelvic floor, muscle nerve uh, experts of the pelvis. And conceptually, we believe in rehabilitation. So not really pain doctors, but we believe in rehabbing the pelvic floor muscles. Awesome. And for those who want to learn the foundations of pelvic floor and even more details on the type of work that Dr. Shrikande does, listen to that episode. And you can also check out the um, Spotify podcast playlist where I collated all the pelvic floor episodes. So since there's a lot of products that we want to talk about, why don't we just start diving right into that? So let's start with biofeedback products. And so it seems like, and maybe I didn't categorize these exactly correct, but it seems like there's in the vagina and then external for what I would consider biofeedback. So in the vagina, for those um, who would like to associate it with different brands, you've got things like LV, PeriFit, KFit, Flight, and possibly others. So talk to us about those and also if there's any differences that people should be aware of. So what we really wanna get at is what do they do and then you know, what might be some of the concerns or risks with using something like this? Conceptually, we can start with in, in the vagina. I would say I would correlate LV and PeriFit as very similar, and then KFit and Flight would be similar, and I'll explain why. Um, conceptually, what LV and PeriFit are doing is they are biofeedback, right? So what does that even mean? Um, biofeedback is when uh, internally, this is an internal biofeedback options, you put a sensor on the pelvic floor muscles, one sensor, and then um, as, what, when you contract your pelvic floor muscles, you can see the contraction of the different muscles going on. Um, and both of them have great little apps. And then when you download the app, when you're, you put the internal device in and you contract and release and you can watch how you're doing on your, uh, on your phone. Uh, so that really is conceptually what they're doing. And why, why watch? It just shows you um, that mental, that image of the different muscles that are contracting. Uh, and it shows you the progress you've made. Uh, it, it, it measures your progress and strength of contraction. So it's really just a visual rather than kind of sitting there blindly trying to do Kegels, trying to find that pelvic floor, which can be super challenging to find uh, for anyone. It really gives you a nice visual of all your hard work that you're doing. That's what I, what that's what those are doing, with, and it's really internal biofeedback machines. Now the difference with uh, PeriFit that 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 LV doesn't have is PeriFit does also have uh, its little game, so it's more makes it I don't know more fun, more um, just enjoyable for some people if you enjoy that uh, aspect of play, of doing games, um, almost like a video video type game with your pelvic floor. So it's really cool. You can you really use your muscles to contract and control things. So it gives you that. Extra extra element, element of not just contracting those muscles, but how well can you ultimately control and guide the muscles and then really separate out different parts of that large pelvic floor, right? That pelvic floor is a big sling from the front, 
from the pubic symphysis in the front all the way to the coccyx in the back. So multiple different, different muscles uh, lie within that pelvic floor. Um, and when you are able to really control different parts of the pelvic floor, that really would be the ultimate. And in order to do a score highly on these video games, you would have to really say, oh, I want to engage my anterior compartment right now to win. The, and then, oh, no, I want to engage my posterior compartment or the posterior right aspect of my pelvic floor. So that's really what's going on when you're playing these video games is learning that uh, technique of engaging certain aspects of your pelvic floor muscles. And does LV allow for you to understand the different parts of your pelvic floor that are engaging that just doesn't have the game or does it not look at the different parts of your pelvic floor? It, it does as well. Uh, look at different parts of your pelvic floor. Uh, I, I'd say when you are trying to play the video game though, it does push you, I guess, to a, a, another level of really, um, really engaging certain areas to kind of win the game. Um, but both of them will allow you to engage all aspects of the pelvic floor, which is great. Um, I'm glad you're saying this because I know I had done um, another interview where there was concern that when using these apps, one of the things to look at is being able to understand what parts of the pelvic floor you need to engage to make sure that it's the right ones and you don't want it to be a generic assessment. So I guess maybe a couple questions in there. Um, one, it sounds like you're validating these do look at the different sections, but would you say that it knows which sections you need to, or is this where you know, the watch out for these devices is really first talking to an expert to understand what you need, and then from there, having some sort of reinforcement at home based on what the expert is telling you you need to do. So how does all that fit in? Georgie, I love that you brought that up. The way I look at these these apps and devices, it would be as your home exercise program. So an extension of a program that is led by an expert. Um, that's how I would look at them. So I do, I do think there is, a, it's very important to have an evaluation by a pelvic floor expert before kind of starting any program because um, you don't really know what's going on. I mean, I, taking a, a step back, I mean, a lot of these devices are for what we call hypotonic pelvic floor, where your pelvic floor muscles are kind of floppy, right, and weak. Um, and it, there's the second aspect is hypertonic pelvic floor, where your pelvic floor muscles are in spasm, so they're short spastic, and they're still weaker, though. Either way, they're weak, honestly. It's just one is in spasm and one is um, loosey-goosey um, hypotonic. So that is number one. You have to have a, an evaluation and decide where you stand in that. And what can be complicated, particularly for postpartum women, is that sometimes parts of the pelvic floor are in hypertonic state and other aspects of the pelvic floor are in a hypotonic pelvic state. So that that's the challenge, right? Figuring out where it needs to be released and then where it needs to be strengthened. So that that's kind of the number one place to start is get a proper evaluation to understand what's going on because no matter what, even if you have weakness, it can be caused by two different reasons from, from the muscle standpoint, from the pelvic floor muscular standpoint. So first you need an evaluation. And then number two, yeah, I, I would look at it, like I said, as an extension because A, you don't want to do these too soon. If you are in a hypertonic state, there may be time where you need to do your Kegels, but if you do Kegels right away, you're going to actually make your, your symptoms worse. You're going to make your urgent continence worse. Um, you're going to make any discomfort you have um, with around the pelvic bowel bladder intercourse worse. So first, you really need to decide when to do this. So a lot of times, if you are in a hypertonic state, first you need to have the, those muscles released properly, and then one, when, when the time is right, you can start your, your neuromuscular re-education training so it's all about timing um, so that's really important because we don't want we don't want your symptoms to get worse uh, so so other than the evaluation it's figuring out what kind of state your pelvic floor is in um, and then yes you design a program with your uh, with your pelvic floor expert that you're working with either a physiatrist at pelvic rehabilitation medicine or a pelvic floor physical therapist could help you um, because the program needs how often do you need to do it how you know how long um, etc but a lot of it is just deciding where the issues are in your pelvic floor and then 
what is going on. And then you can design a home program um, to really get you better faster. First, as you can tell, I wanted to dive right into the product, um, the products, but not everyone is going to listen to every single episode about the pelvic floor before listening to this. So the context is, is important and I appreciate you sharing that. I guess a, a couple questions in there. So if you have certain muscles that are in a hypotonic state and others that are in hypertonic, can you program the app and say, hey, this one is hypotonic, this one's hypertonic? No, no, not. Uh, but classically, Georgie, what we do is we, we classically would just release those hy the hypertonic areas first, and then you engage in the neuromuscular re-education of the pelvic floor altogether once the release is complete. That's classically what we do. You release everything, get it all, and then you start the strengthening. It's usually the safest bet. Let me ask you this, because one of the things that really has become clear on the podcast, and I actually just did an interview on period poverty, you know, a lot of these products are for a very small population of people who can afford them. And even trying to see specialists like yourself, unfortunately, like even though, you know, you and, and all of your colleagues who focus on pelvic floor have the best of intentions of helping patients, you have to pay bills. And you know a lot of these are unfortunately cash paying services. So let's say someone's listening to you and they're like, oh, I think I got it. I'm just gonna go purchase it on Amazon if they can even afford to do that. What would be your caution um, for someone who's just desperate and you know can at least afford the Amazon and feels like that's enough? and doesn't go see the doctor? Like, what would you want them to know? I would urge at least maybe one consult if possible. <laughs> that would be uh, from a, a local pelvic floor specialist, just one. I'm not saying you have to repetitively go, but if you can figure out a way to get in there one time, that would be extremely beneficial then to plan your home program. Um, so what I would be concerned with would just be making your symptoms worse. So I think what I would do if you you say, I got this, I'm going to go purchase one of these devices and do it on my own at home. I would just listen to your body uh, while you're doing it, particularly for the first week or two. Are you getting better or, or worse? Um, so I think if you have a heightened sensitivity or just kind of li trying to pay attention to your symptoms, then you could probably catch it pretty fast. Listen, I used to go to go to the bathroom four times every three hours, and now I go eight. So clearly um, my, my urgency frequency and sometimes my urgent continence is actually getting a bit worse, and I'm working really hard at home with my device. So that's really what I would, would do is just pay attention. Or I've had patients who've done this before, like, which I completely get, where, again, they bought a device, tried it at home, tried their Kegels when they were really hypertonic, um, and they started to get new symptoms. So uh, I only had urge incontinence. It was only my bladder. But now I've been working really hard doing this at home for, for two to three weeks. And, and now all of a sudden um, I'm constipated, straining on the toilet, and I'm having a bit of soreness post-intercourse that I had never had before. So this, what's going on? So that's those are kind of the classic ways to, to see if what you're doing, if you're on the right path or not. I just want to make a comment on the importance of improving access to care, uh, and I completely agree. And I, I, for us at Pelvic Rehabilitation Medicine, what we're trying to, what we have been doing uh, over the past couple of years, is really just collecting large amounts of data to show that uh, what we're doing helps patients. That our outpatient rehabilitation program is working and helping, um, and really trying to now contract in network with the payers because that's really the only way to improve access to care but we couldn't have a we couldn't have kept the, the way the payers are set up we really could not have hired doctors and kept the lights on at first but now that we have all this data that is our hope that we can work with the payers to, to really show that this is a real area of medicine that needs attention um, and hopefully get patients the access they need for this kind of niche area of medicine. No, absolutely. And thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I really hope that, you know, as I continue to interview guests, we can figure out um, solutions for people who just don't have access. I mean, the episode on period poverty was around just even accessing tampons. I mean, how far we are in this country for people getting access is um, is pretty horrific. And and I just at least like to acknowledge it on the podcast Um to know that, to help people understand, like we are aware of it and it's a big complex problem to solve from the simplest of, you know, and, and 
you know, having your period isn't even a medical condition. It's just, you know, a thing that, that happens to women and it's, it's um, disheartening, but it is wonderful when I talk to people who are really trying um, the best that they can. So thank you for sharing that effort. So let's talk about KFIT and flight. Sure. So KFIT and flight. So again, these are still in the realm of the internal devices in, in, inside the vagina. Um, but what they're doing is when, when you put insert the device, there is also an electrical impulse that comes with it. So it's not just a biofeedback where you contract and you see the image and you can watch what you're doing, that mind-body connection with the pelvic floor. There is an actual electrical impulse that is going on. Um, so it's in, under the realm of what we call neuromuscular um, electrical stimulation. So what does that mean? It's a fancy term for really getting the nerves to talk to the muscles, which is in the rehab world, in our world at Pelvic Rehabilitation and Medicine, um, a, a concept that we really do live and die by because the nerves and the muscles, they need to talk and have a nice connection for strength and lift, right? It's not really just about the muscle fiber strength. It's actually that nerve muscle connection that really gives you that dynamic lift and support that you want all areas of your body, but particularly the pelvis. Um, so what it is, is it's a controlled electrical pulse, right? And it's either directed at nerves or it can be directed at muscle groups. Um, and these electrical pulses, what they do is they cause muscles to contract. Um, so, and then when they cause that repetitive contraction, then you conceptually, you're working your muscles out and you're getting that muscle strength that was missing. So that's the difference. Um, and then KFIT, that's what it is. Flight does take it again to another level where flight, of course, it's doing that neuromuscular electrical stimulation, but it's also doing something called mechanical mechanical therapy. Um, and that really is just a fancy word for as the device goes in, it's giving your fascias and fascia and your muscles and the pelvic floor a bit of a stretch. Uh, so conceptually mimicking what pelvic floor physical therapy also does. So that's why it, it just takes it to a bit of a different level there. So it is stretching while it gives off that gentle impulse uh, to stimulate that nerve muscle connection and strength of the muscle overall. Interesting. So if you have the tight pelvic floor muscle, would it be relevant for that? Yeah, that's the one. I mean, again, it's challenging, Georgie, because there is no real data on any of these devices. Uh, but I, yeah, for me, I mean, that's something that that's one that we have in, in pelvic rehabilitation medicine. The majority of our patients are either a mixed picture or hypertonic picture. So that is one that we have kind of recommended uh, patients, certain patients do try. But again, it's all about timing. So that's the challenge because even if you do this too soon too, you could get you make your symptoms worse and then you just have your back pedaling into that vicious cycle so it's just all about when you're ready to try it it's a great thing if you're not ready it's, if it's too soon it could cause more harm than good fempower health is pleased to partner with the upcoming femtech and consumer innovation summit the summit is the latest deep dive event part of the women's health innovation series looking to tackle this growing sector of women's health having had continental success in driving innovation, investment, research, and partnerships in traditional women's healthcare by bringing together critical stakeholders. Join us in New York on June 7th and 8th as we channel this success into the consumer sector of women's health. Visit www.femtechconsumerinnovation.com to view the superstar speaker lineup and enter code FEMPOWER15 for 15% off your ticket. Hope to see you there. When you're putting in the electrodes, like, is it easy to know? Like, I'm just thinking right now, like, where does it go? Is it easy to put there? And like, am I going to have like a massive shock attack? I mean, I assume they've tested for all of this if it's an at-home device, but I would love for you, just in case anyone else is curious, maybe you can talk a bit about that. Yeah, no, that's true. It is a great, it's a great question. 
Um, you know, they, they have the settings. They, they do control for settings that are safe, right? So that, that's what they're doing. And, you, you know, the impulse, you really, um, you barely notice it or feel it. It's not really that you're noticing the impulse as much as you are more noticing the contraction of the pelvic floor muscles. You, you're sensing that contraction. Uh, but the actual impulse, uh, you, you really don't feel or notice. Uh, and they do have settings where they're, they don't let you go to an inappropriate setting. So now let's talk about the Innovos and Ele- I think it's Elatone of those products. I think they're slightly different, so I don't know if we can necessarily compare them, but, but let's talk about those. Yeah, no, great. So they're in the realm of the external devices, but so these two are also neuromuscular electrical stimulation devices. So that's conceptually what they're doing, again, is neuromuscular re-education, um, s- similar to the K-Fit and the flight, but it's external. So Novo, what it is, it's shorts, um, actually. Uh, they brought it to our New York City office, I guess, two years ago. So I was able to try one on. Um, so it's shorts you put on, and then the different sensors are outside the shorts, and those sensors are stimulating your pelvic floor. So that's what it, conceptually what it is th- with these products is you can put them on, set it, and forget it, right? You put them on, and then it does the work for you. So you're not kind of sitting around um, constantly doing your pelvic floor exercises. Um, you put the, the shorts on, and you can kind of do other things. So that's what the Innovo is. Um, with the um, Elatone, I have, n- uh, so Elatone, what it is, it's similar, but it's it's not shorts that you're putting on. It look It's like you put it right w- w- like your pad would be, like a maxi pad. So you put it in your underwear, slip it in like you would a pad, and then conceptually what it's doing, again, is stimulating that pelvic floor to contract and release, contract and release, contract and release. Um, so again, it's it's also in the realm of neuromuscular electrical stimulation. And with the Elitone, you have something, a little wire, after you put the pad in, you usually drop it in, in your pocket. Um, and again, set it and forget it, go on with your day, don't really, you don't, conceptually, you don't have to think about it, that's what they're doing. It's, it's just an external way of doing it versus internal. Are they essentially similar function and you take your pick or are there differences when it's internal versus external as far as, I don't know, the effectiveness of it? You know, again, no randomized controlled trial data here. I would say it's more of a preference, a patient preference as to how you would want to stimulate your pelvic floor. Um, However, I guess from just thinking about it, I I would think, you know, the, the KFIT or the flight, when you're actually putting something internal, it probably has a, a higher level of efficacy of we know we're stimulating it. Um, we're not going to miss it, right? Because we're going right to the source. But really, I, I think it's a, it's a patient preference. Uh, you know, conceptually, they're all, it's a lot, a lot of different products, a lot of different, different names thrown around, but really all really doing a similar thing. Some of these are FDA approved. I'm curious how someone, a consumer who is trying to purchase these should look at something that is FDA approved versus not. Because I, I, I do believe in um, that with medical devices, it's a very different degree of approvals throughout the FDA that are required than when it comes to a pharmaceutical product, I'm talking about like a pill or an injection. Um, so devices are in a whole different category just for everyone um, to be aware of. And so I'd love to get your perspective. I don't know if you've dove into that that topic, but it might be something helpful because I know at least one of these is FDA approved. So yeah, I mean, FDA approval, that's great. It's, it helps, right? I would think it's a positive uh, sign that it's been through, through a rigorous kind of clinical uh, evaluation. So I think that's excellent. Um, In the world of medical device, it is much easier to get something FDA approved when it's external, right? So so the internal devices probably have a couple more hoops to jump over uh, for FDA approval. Yeah, I would look at it as another stamp of approval. And I, I think a consumer can take it as as they wish. It, sometimes it's just timing, which, you know, I think Inovo came out 
to before, so it takes some time. So um, some may be FDA approval. They may be pending their FDA, FDA approval. You could probably ask them that if, if it's something you're interested in. Are you applying? Um, are you pending? Where are you in the process? Any questions or concerns you would have, I would definitely not hold back and ask them and get someone on the phone and make sure all your questions are answered. Okay, I love that. Thank you. So next we go to Thighmaster-like tools. So I went on different areas of, of the interwebs to research these types of products. And when I was on Amazon, I typed in like pelvic floor tools and these like Thighmaster looking devices were listed and I was like, wait, what? Maybe it's just the way Amazon categorized it. But if you read the descriptions, they are talking about the pelvic floor. And so before I give a, a thought that I had about it, I wanted to hear from you and then I would love to share what, what my reaction was. And I apologize if I sound like I'm prefacing that these definitely don't work. Um, I'm not at all trying to. Um, I'm more just like fascinated with this as a possibility, um, given what I know about the pelvic floor from the wonderful experts I've interviewed. So from Dr. Shrikande, what what's your perspective on the, the Thighmaster-like tools? If you have any sort of pelvic floor dysfunction, that's not something I would be advising, um, is to try that. Um, overall, I mean, the thigh master conceptually, it's working on what we call adductors. So those muscles that are in the inner thigh that go into your pubic symphysis there, they, they connect to your pubic symphysis. So conceptually, it's saying that while you're contracting your adductors, you have to engage your core, your pelvic floor, which is the core of your body, right? Um, so I, that may be the connection they're trying to make. But overall, from most people that with pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, um, actually do have compensatory issues with their adductor muscles. So quite often they're a problem too, which makes sense because your pelvic floor core is, is weak. It's either hyper or hypotonic, but either way it's weak. So when it's not functioning as it should to hold up the organs, right, the bowel, the bladder, and all your sexual organs, and to support the spine and the hips, it has a really important job, the pelvic floor. When it's not functioning that well, something has to help it out, and it's the surrounding muscles. And one of the major muscle groups that comes into play to support a pelvic floor muscle dysfunction person is your adductor muscles. So they're quite often uh, and need some help on their own for our patient population. Uh, either way, hyper or hypotonic. So for pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, thigh master for me is definitely a, a big no-no until you resolve your pelvic floor issues. Then if you want to, when you're, you're all better and doing really well, if you're really into it then at that point. But first you want to resolve your pelvic floor. My reaction was similar and, you know, I am not a doctor, but I'm, I, to be honest with you, the reason why my reaction was this way is one, I've interviewed so many of the experts and I've been taking Pilates. I do it on the reformer. I'm so appreciative of the membership programs because I could never afford how much it costs to do the typical classes. When I am doing the part where you lift your, you have your legs in the straps, like the final exercise they do in the session and there's a part where you lift your legs up and down and then you spread them to, if you can, the width of the reformer or wider and then you do the big circles. And when I'm closing my legs, that motion is what I was thinking of when I saw the thigh master and I work so hard on my pelvic floor because I'm in perimenopause and I was actually diagnosed with stage one prolapse and I am noticing the difference since I've hit this stage of life and I can't even do anything with my pelvic floor when I'm trying to close my I have no control and so when I saw this thigh master as an option I thought wow I don't know how this would even work and so I guess I fall into the category of you're not ready um, and maybe I need to come visit you soon so <laughs> So the next is Kegel weights and balls, and I'm not sure if jade eggs fall into the same category, but I had to bring up jade eggs because there are some famous people out there talking a lot about jade eggs, and so um, I thought it would be helpful just to put all of this in in, um, in a bucket and discuss. So maybe we can break break those down between the, the Kegel weights and balls and then um, commenting on the jade eggs. 
again, Georgie, no really uh, randomized controlled trials on this, but from my perspective, from I do not recommend either Kegel weights, Kegel balls, or jade eggs. Um, why? I actually postpartum had my own issues, which is why I got into this this world of medicine. But I purchased the Kegel weights and balls because I thought maybe this this is going to help me. Um, but I, I think you don't really need a weight. It's it's not a place in your body where you need a weight to engage your core, engage your pelvic floor muscles, and get the neuromuscular edu re-education and um, get the strength you're looking for. It's more, it's just not something that I think it's actually could cause more harm than good, the weights. I, I do not see, the, the, this doesn't make sense in my head. Right? Again, I'm not reading data. This is not something I'm reading trials on, like other aspects of medicine. But it just doesn't make sense because there's so much you can do to engage and get your pelvic floor lifted and more dynamic without weights. So I don't think this is an area of the body where I ever suggest to go buy those weights and try to lift them. You don't need it. You really don't. Um, so so that's one thing. And then the jade eggs, they're not weights. They're like, I, you know, my patients have told me about them. So they're little crystals. And I think conceptually there's a spiritual connection to them. So that's completely different from the medical aspect. But medically, when, I mean, what happens to your body if you put a jade egg in, it, what it does is it stimulates your pelvic floor into this contraction mode. And then you're in this kind of contracted mode for a while, trying to hold up the egg. So it's the rest of it is a release and a contract, release, contract, right? Which is more natural, healthy way that you want the pelvic floor to move up and down, almost like um, uh, it, it needs to move up and down, almost like a, uh, a parachute would. Uh, but with the jade egg, you go into this constant contracting. So again, medically, I, I, we're not, we don't see... Uh, a good use for it medically, but the other aspect, the spiritual, I can't comment on that part. Okay. Just back to the Kegel weights and balls, how do they work? Are there different weights? So it's kind of like, you know, strength training, like start with the, you know, your five pound weight. Okay. Graduate to the eight, graduate to the 10. I mean, obviously these Kegel weights won't be that heavy, but are there like different weights where they say, Hey, start out with this one and then graduate to this. And is that how they work? There are different weights. I, I don't know the exact. I don't know if it ranges from what one to three pounds or something like that. So there are different weights, but you can get. I, I, again, it's. I don't. Re we don't use them. We don't recommend them. So it's, yeah, at this point, I, I don't know the, the different options. But I do know they do come in different, different weights. So you can start low, okay. um, which is good. Okay. Just. It, it, it doesn't, um, there's just so much connective t tissue, particularly for our postpartum patients, laxity that's going on that it's just not the way to go. There's a lot you can do with the, you know, the internal neuromuscular e stim and the biofeedback and then yoga in general, and just engaging your core and working with pelvic floor, P pelvic floor PT, that it's not something we discuss or recommend to our patients. Okay. Now, what about, you know, Again, you were kind of alluding to this, so it's a great transition, just doing your exercises. And so I was reading um, a book and preparing for another episode on um, pelvic floor health about hypopressives. And I mentioned to you that I've been doing um, the reformer um, for Pilates, but also you can do floor Pilates exercises. So tell us about, you know, a long time ago, we didn't have these devices and, and people survived. I mean, granted, I'm sure a lot were suffering, so I don't want to minimize the impact of um, these devices and the availability of them. I do think it's incredible to have these options. But, you know, just going back to simplicity, hypopressives and Pilates and, and other exercises. Yeah, no. So uh, with the hypopressives, I mean, conceptually, what they're trying to do is get that the pelvic floor, like I said, almost like a parachute, contracting with the with the diaphragm and really opening. Um, and with the Pilates and the pelvic floor exercises, uh, we do recommend at when patients are ready. Again, for us, if when we first meet patients, um, can, we don't say let's start with Pilates yet. We get patients and they're. We, their pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, we rehabilitate their nerves and their muscles of their pelvis, get them on the right track, 
And then usually it's at that six week follow up, really post our classic outpatient protocol, is that we, we say, you're ready now. Now it's time. And we have a very specific yoga program that we like to use. Um, Your Pace Yoga by Dusty and Miller is great, or Adrian's Yoga. Um, and or Pilates. And we, we do Pilates if there's any sort of, we call it hypermobility, which is very common in our patient population. About 35% of our patients have it where it's loosey-goosey. You're very hyper-flexible. Um, then definitely Pilates would be the way to go for more of a stabilization program. Where do hypopressives fit in? And maybe you can just dive a little bit more into what that is and how it might differ from Pilates. Yeah, I mean, conceptually, I, I, with the hypopressives, it really is just using the breath and the diaphragm to open up that pelvic floor space. And there's just different ways to, to do that, different positions that you can be in. Right, different positions that you can be in to really get that pelvic floor and diaphragm working as a nice unit up and down rather than conceptually, as they often are, fighting each other. So they need to kind of work as a nice unit and um, go up and down together in sort of a flow. And a lot of that has to do with your breath work in certain positions that you're in. And listening to you describing it, I mean, I guess, is, first of all, is there harm in doing them? You would have to speak with your, your medical professional to make sure you don't have any underlying issues such as maybe COPD or asthma, so uh, hard for me to say overall. I would definitely get clearance though from your doctor before doing it, particularly if you have any comorbidities. Because just the, the way you were describing it, I'm thinking, wow, if I want to do something that could potentially help my pelvic floor and if it doesn't do a ton of harm, I almost feel like doing these exercises is almost like an alternative to meditation or like a multitasking of, because you know the deep breathing is so important for us to be relaxing and we forget we're working and we have all these short breaths all day long. And so I'm like, wow, should I do a hypopressive to both like help with the breathing and then also potentially help with that, that movement? No, I mean, for us, we are more into the other than to the yoga, particularly if there's no hypermobility. So because of what you're saying, Georgie, it's, it's everything. I don't, you know, everyone's busy. (laughs) You have a busy lifestyle. I don't want to give you 10 things to do at home, but I, once patients are better, again, you, it's not at the beginning. It's when we get you on on your road to 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 really healing and your your pain and function are significantly improved. We give you this program, and for the yoga, you should say if you do it three to five times a week, it's really going to maintain all that progress because it teaches you everything: the diaphragmatic breathing, working down training, working on that vagus nerve and its effect on the central nervous system, really having the diaphragm and the pelvic floor floor work together, but also getting that neuromuscular re-education of the pelvic floor the hip abductors, the deep spinal rotators, everything that needs to be functioning well to to keep your pelvic floor open and happy, getting blood flow there, all good things. So that's why we we do like specific yoga programs because it lets them just do one thing and then they're getting so, the benefits are immense um, medically. With so many of your patients having hypermobility, are they able to do yoga um, or do you mostly focus on Pilates for them? We would mostly focus on Pilates for them. Okay. I mean, overall yoga in general, the yoga we suggest is more of a restorative yoga we describe it as, so a lot of breathing, restorative. But however, if there is hypermobility, we, we, we lean heavy towards Pilates uh, for more of this core stabilization to try to compensate for that loosey-goosey ligament that's not doing its job. So Pilates is great for hypermobility. So you talked a lot today about, you know, well, there isn't a randomized clinical um, controlled clinical trial. Is this the case in like almost everything pelvic floor related? Because I know that when the clinical trials are done, you know, there has to be someone who is interested in doing it and someone who can pay for it. And a lot of times it's influenced by certain business decisions like being able to, um, you know, release a product that supports a given condition. And so it's extremely complex. I just want everyone to understand that space. So are there like, is it limited clinical trials? Are there just none out there? Like what's out there to to help people make decisions around what they need to do to support their, their pelvic floor health? Yeah, 
I would, if you're interested in a certain product, I would kind of investigate on their website any clinical trials. I know I saw Innovo has had s several, and it is FDA approved, so they have gone through the, that process. Um, yeah, it just it takes a lot of time, effort, manpower, finance, financial resources to make all of those things happen. So I think that's why it is limited. Um, but and overall, in medicine. It's classically how we can kind of deduce which what's better, you know, which way to do it is better, or you know, what's working is having outcome measures is what we say. They're, we call them outcome measures. So, but but you know, overall, I, if the main concern is safety, then I, if they're they don't if you're not satisfied with what their website has, then I would get someone on the phone and ask all the questions you want in, in terms of safety and what your major concern would be. So Dr. Srikande, why don't we also talk about pessaries? I know that they're not formally there to strengthen the pelvic floor, but they are something that has been discussed on so many episodes as being really supportive for women with um, pelvic floor dysfunction. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, a pessary is something that you you insert vaginally to when you have prolapse. It's most commonly either postpartum or sometimes in 65 plus, plus um, age range when um, that can happen, when you can have be predisposed to having prolapse. Conceptually, it just helps hold things up in a non-operative fashion. And um, you know, sometimes I say postpartum, try it because you're still, you're, particularly if you're breastfeeding, right, your hormones are regulating and sometimes you, it gives you time uh, to see how you'll, your pelvic floor and your connective tissue and your fascia will do long term postpartum when you, your hormones start to regulate again. So in closing, I, I really appreciate your perspective and I appreciate you caveating so many of the dynamics that we need to consider. And this is why healthcare is hard and this is why we need experts like yourself. What would you say is the one takeaway that listeners should have when it comes to trying to strengthen their pelvic floor and they're considering these at-home devices? Listen to your body. If your symptoms are getting better, that's amazing. And it sounds, you, you're most likely on the right path. If your symptoms are not progressing at all or progressing in the wrong direction or you're getting symptoms that you didn't have before, then I would take a step back, stop it, and um, reevaluate and see a healthcare provider. And overall, if you can, before using any of these devices, I would really get an evaluation by a pelvic floor specialist. Thank you. And thank you for your commitment. And thank you so much also for really taking things to the next level now that you have more patient data. These are the types of things that are needed to be able to get more coverage. And so thank you for, for I would say, I would call advocacy work as well um, in this space. So thank you again. Thank you, Georgie. Thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for tuning in to this discussion on the FemPower Health podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to information that is referred to in this episode. And if you like this episode and found it timely and valuable, please take a moment to tell a friend or a colleague about FemPower Health. And right after this episode is over, please think of one person who might find this episode helpful and tell them about it. And if your friend is new to podcasting, please show them how to subscribe to our show. And another way to support FemPower Health Podcast is to leave a review where you listen to podcasts. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for information purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. See you next week.
Thank you for joining us on another enlightening episode of FemPower Health. No matter where you are in your journey, our website is brimming with content tailored to your specific topic of interest or life stage. Dive in and discover the resources and insights waiting for you. Your voice matters to us. And if you found value in this episode, please take a moment to write a review. Your feedback not only helps us improve, but it also helps others discover our podcast. By spreading the word, you're empowering women everywhere with the information they need to navigate their unique health journeys. And if this episode resonated with you, please don't keep it a secret. Share it with friends, loved ones, or anyone you believe would benefit from the information. Together, we can create a world where every woman feels supported, informed, and empowered. Remember, knowledge is power and FemPower Health is here to guide you and support you in every step of the way. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for informational purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Until next time.